Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors, America's only daily outdoor TV show. Your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Winston Chester. Glad you're here on this Monday morning. We had a great show lined up, but first, our weather brought to us by Haney Technical Center at the corner of Baldwin and Highway 77. Been a lot of graduations coming up pretty soon all over the place, not just here in Florida, but all over the country. So I have two granddaughters graduating, one at Mosley and one at Brentwood High School up in Tennessee. So we'll be talking about that later. But let's get started with our show. And we're looking at a high today of 80 and a low of 64. And water temperature is right at, the same way it was last week, right at 81 degrees. So it's in pretty good shape. Our moon phase brought to us by Mountain Dew. Take it outside with Mountain Dew. And this is the week we have our full moon on Saturday night. Be the May full moon, and I know you're tired of me talking about it, but this week right here is a week my dad would always go fishing on a regular basis on Teloji Creek and catch them red belly brim. And we'd eat them about two or three times that week. So this is a, this is a good, good week to freshwater fish. Our, our tide chart brought to us by Kent Forest Long. Decent tide today, uh, 212 a.m. Of course, this morning was a low tide and high tide. Now, it's different now. Over the weekend, it came in around noon. Now, the high tide is going around 5 o'clock. Okay, it's changing. The tides are always changing. That's why I give them every day. They're, they're different. And uh, we're going into some neap tides toward that full moon. We won't have much tidal flow at all. Uh, our marine forecast coming out of the west, straight out of the west at about 10 to 12. All right, let's keep our, uh, keep our eyes on, on, that, uh, on that wind now. It's sort of an odd direction right now. All right, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Uh, let me give mention first, uh, we lost the outdoor world, lost a real uh, strong man that was so vital in, uh, in the wildlife and all. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've met this guy before, and, and Jim Fowler uh, passed away a couple of days ago, and uh, I'm gonna talk more about him tomorrow, tomorrow's show. I, I met Jim, Jim Fowler, talked to him, and had an interview with him, and he's just a, a gentleman. But I, and I didn't realize reading up on him, he was actually born and raised in Albany, Georgia on a family farm, and an interesting biography, and I talk, like I say, talk more about it tomorrow, but he was, uh, you know, people remember him sometimes coming on Johnny Carson's show, but he was originally with Marlon Perkins in Mutual of Omaha's Hall's uh, Wild Kingdom, and he did, he was one that Marlon Perkins would send in the water after that crocodile and all, and Marlon would talk about it, and Jim Fowler would get in there and wrestle him and all, but I'll see if I can find some more information, but uh, the outdoor world lost a, uh, a fine man in Jim Fowler, a gentleman of that man, and, and uh, he, he was on Johnny Carson. I did not realize he was on Johnny Carson as much. He was on Johnny Carson over 100 times in his career. That's, that's amazing on tonight's show. But let's move on. Speaking of wild things and wild kingdom, how about them wild yellow flies? Are they, are they still bothering y'all? I, I looked at my score right now. I'm ahead 14 to 4. Uh, I've, I've killed 14 yellow flies, been bit four times. And I was telling Jeff, the most aggravating time is when they come in, in the garage. You got your garage door open and I've been sort of piddling around with my boats and all in my garage and uh, Gail's been nice enough to move her car and let me keep the boat in the garage while I'm working on it and just piddling, you know. And, and when they bite me in my garage, that's more aggravating than being in the yard. So it just, but anyway, what I did, I brought one of my aloe plants. I've got, I wouldn't say a bunch of them, I've got several of them. And the, the aloe plant is just, it's just a wonderful plant you know, the, the industry uses, there are a lot of people using, uh, the makeup people use the moisturizer and all. It's been around since, uh, they, uh, uh, since the first century. They've got documented how aloe plants been used. And this is one of my, uh, th you should have them in a clay pot. Most of them in a clay pot. This, what happens, they, they break off, start new plants, and I just stick them in there. But anyway, when I get bit by a yellow fly, all I do, let's see, all I do, uh, I'm going to break, I just, I'm going to go ahead and break this off. See, see that moisture and all in there? That, and you just rub that on the mosquito bite, yellow fly bite, ant bite, or anything. That's natural, that is a natural ingredient right there. Now you don't want to ingest this stuff. It, it's, it's, not, it's not good to ingest it. But as far as just rubbing it on, and, and that's all natural. You, you don't have to go to the store and buy all that cream and all, it's got all the chemicals in it. Just do this. I just want to talk about it. You should have two or three of these around the house. You can see these little ones, they pop up, and I can pull that one out and plant it and have that. And they're, they're just proficient. They're just all over the place. They'll grow, and uh, we've always, uh, they're, they're just good. So I just wanted to recommend you have one of these plants around here. 
It's all natural. Uh, what else did I have about? Oh, they even put them in shaving cream. They put them in moisturizers, put them in soap and shampoo. And uh, it's, it's topical. I found out they even put them in yogurt and desserts, little traces of it. So it's a good plant, but do not eat this stuff, okay? So that's the aloe plant and the yellow fly bites. Let's move on. I did see where, talking about St. Joe State Park, we've talked about the cut right there where the, the Hurricane Michael washed it out at the campground and between there and the, and the boat ramp. And there's some interesting things going on. At first, they're going to leave it natural, let it natural fill in. Then there's a school of thought where a group of people wanted to go ahead and fill it in and put their rocks up there and make a road so the campers could get in this summer and have a place to camp. So the latest I'd heard was that. They were going to fill it in. And now there's a group of people, so now uh, still want to leave it natural. So I don't know the pros and cons. I personally, you know, leave things natural, but I can understand the urge of people wanting to camp and all, but I wouldn't, it, it, the less you mess with Mother Nature, the better off we are. And if, if you, uh, so I'm going to get information on both sides and just throw it out to you, but that's a, that's a big deal uh, as, as far as uh, what the state's going to do. I know they're both, both voices are wanting to be heard, and, and uh, if any of y'all want to uh, send me some information on it, I'll be glad to share it with our viewers and all, okay? Let's go ahead and uh, let's take our break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Glad you're with us on this Monday morning. We appreciate you supporting the sponsors that bring you Panhandle Outdoors. We've got a bunch of them now, and they're all good people, family-owned, local businesses, and uh, Small Business America. And we're, just, we're very proud of them. We really appreciate your support of them. Now, let's get into, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about Pompano, you know, last week or two, and, and I'm also getting into brim fishing this week and all. And as, I've, there's two different ways to fish for Pompano. I want you to understand this. And I I've got I've uh, gotten to I do the laser thing. I I walk up. I used to cast a lot, you know, with jigs. I walk them down the beach casting, and then you know we let it so, sort of soak. It's sort of there. And people call it soak fishing. You soak the bait. You really just sit sit out there. And I say over the years I've just sort of evolved into that because I can do two or three different things. So you've seen a lot of my surf fishing where I'm doing that. Now another way to do it. A lot of guys have, have done this for a long time. You get in your boat and you go to these different potholes and try to find them in a hole, and you, it's called sight fishing. You can actually see them flash in the water, and that's a fascinating way to do it, and I, I, I don't do as much as, as we used to, but I still go with some people to do it because you pretty well know where the holes are, and you can cruise them down the beach, and all, they've changed since Hurricane Michael. The holes have moved around a little bit. It's been fascinating, but they're still in the same general area. But sight fishing for them, is a lot of fun. And I got a little video uh, when I went with Chappie Chambers and a couple of his buddies, and Chappie is an excellent fisherman, and we went out of Treasure Island, we just right outside the pass, the hole out there, and, and we're just sight fishing. I didn't fish, I just I went along as a cameraman on this one and watched those guys do it. So I just wanted you to see if some of y'all coming in uh, as new viewers and all, when you go sight fishing for Pompano, it's just a lot of fun. And, and you can, we actually just stayed in one hole. Now we could have caught a lot more fish if we moved down another hole, but we're just trying to get a little bit of footage and showing you all about sight fishing. So Jeff, let's roll this video. All right, folks, here we are at Treasure Island, getting ready, it's early in the morning, getting ready to go out for Captain Chappie. Chappie, what's our game plan this morning? Well, I hope we catch a pompano, maybe a cobia, whatever swims. All right, we're going after them. On the famous death trap, <laughs> infamous death trap. Okay. All right, Marshall, tell the folks what are you doing over here? Just trying to catch a few chopers. Go ling fishing with them. Okay, so getting our bait, trying to get it fresh right across there, Captain Anderson's. Okay, now here with the rest of the crew, Captain Chappie on, on an infamous death trap over here. I'm Marshall. Marshall, right down here. I'm Patrick. I fished with these guys before, they know how to fish now. Uh, who's going to catch the biggest fish today? <laughs> Winston. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to be the cameraman. We're going to have a good fishing trip ahead of us. Okay, we're still catching a bait. Chappy, what's he trying to do? He's catching a few chofers for uh, cobia bait, live bait for cobia. You see one. We got eels and, uh, we'll have eels and chofers. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Catch 
fish in our bay right here on the edge of Shell Island. The Yankees call them pinfish. Bay Countyans call them chofers. So what do you call them? I call them chofers. If you call them a pinfish on this boat, you have to walk home. <laughs> All right, folks, we're up here on the tower. Marshall's already hooked up. What you got, Marshall? Pompano. Look at here. Oh, there's one with him. There's one with him. Coming aboard. Right. Hey, my feet leaking. Yeah, don't fall. Leaking. Bye, Shappy. That mentions. All right. Yeah, there's one with him. There's some with him. Marshal got one on up here. Where's your feet, Mark? See the line. I don't know if you see it. Stretched out. Chappie, that's a nice bump up. Clear. All right. A pound and a half. Oh, he's over here. Right. He's over here. Chappie got one on. Finally. What do you think you got, Chappie? I don't know. I think it, they said it was a pompano. I don't know. I haven't seen the color yet. If I don't fall down first. <laughs> that my thing. <laughs> You better net him too? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> he decided he's good. He, he's got some shoulders, hasn't he? Yes, you like me. Look at yourself. About right, Mark. Err. Don't fall down. Oh, it's just rough out here. There it comes, Jimmy. Oh, nice. That was about a pound and a half. Yep. Oh, he went back down. Tell him the captain's about to fall over for trying to catch his fish. <laughs> captain working hard on this one. Here it comes. He's milking it for the camera. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Air time. Would you get your head up? <laughs> Nets are really good. <laughs> you need a net? That's right there. <laughs> All right, I got them on board. The old fashioned way. The old fashioned way. No net. All right. Well, get us some dirty rag off of it. Nice one. Right. Chappie had a fun trip. I'm glad you did. I wish we could have done better. Well, we did good. What we got? A few pompano in here? Yeah, got three. Hello, Patrick. The old man caught the biggest one. Who caught the biggest one? I did. All right. That's nice. Only bad part about that it. That was Marshall's peanut, wasn't it? Yep. That one shrunk up a little bit, hadn't it? Hey, yeah, Pat, I hey, think Pat. it drew up about three inches. Hey, Patrick, how big was yours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the last couple of days, actually. Well, how, how big was yours? <laughs> yeah, for the last three days. <laughs> well, with Marshall, Chappie, and Patrick, got a good trip, fellas. We enjoyed it. Yeah, we enjoyed it. Too All bad right. the weather. The gulf was too rough to get in. We were really excited fish for them. All right, we'll do that next time. Okay, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that. You sort of see what we're talking about. We couldn't, uh, the camera couldn't really pick up the flash, but what you saw a little flash in there, and, and that's when you cast toward them. That, 
That's a lot of fun. Now let's look at our fishing game time today brought to us by Blue Water Outriggers in Port St. Joe. 8.21 to 10.21 this morning and this evening, 8.47 to 10.47. All right, now we're going to go pictures. We usually do the pictures on the first section of the, of the show, but now we're going to do the pictures in the last section. And uh, interesting pictures today. Check this out. This coming out. This comes from Scott Chairs coming out of the Wakala River. Beware of the gator. And we all know sharks up there now. You know, we talk about sharks in fresh water. It is a fact. And uh, that gator, uh, I, that's, that's a pretty strong picture right there. And that's sort of scary. Both of them uh, uh, bite your leg off in a heartbeat. So be careful uh, swimming up there in that Wakala River. Uh, we okay. He can find a river because we got that dam across there. But if we didn't have that dam, there'd be sharks up in there because I see them all the time. Okay, coming in from, uh, th this is a good one right here. This picture here, this is my nephew, uh, Miles Hicks. And Miles got a nice red off a dock, okay? Bobber fishing with a chofa on his, his bait. He was in a canal just north of the Hathaway Bridge. That's Jason Keeps sending that picture. And, and just north of the Hathaway Bridge, you can see that, that is a really nice redfish right there. Caught him on a live chofa. It's hard to be, a live chofa is a good bait. There are a lot of chofas out there. Okay, now this is interesting. One uh, caught this shark with a plastic band around his neck. Got it removed and released back in the wild. Well, you know, we talk all the time about plastic in the, in, the, in the water and all, and it does affect our sea life. But they caught and released it. Good job right there. Don't forget, coming up this Saturday now, May 18th on the full moon, the QDMA, Quality Deer Management Association, doing a fundraiser. And some of this money that goes to scholarships for, for kids in the outdoors. And there's the team right there, and you can call that number at the bottom, Jimmy Higgins or A.B. Smith. And that number there, and uh, good, good calls right there. When Grandma decided to unfriend someone, uh, you can, without whiteout, you can identify with that, some of you people around my age, because when whiteout first came out, we thought that what a, what a godsend to, so you have, I wouldn't have to correct all the type stuff you did, just sort of whiteout over it, but you can't do that. This is interesting here, Kelly Hanlon Newman down in Port St. Joe, after the hurricane, I wonder if this would happen, and if so, how long would it be? I just, the answer is yes, and seven months. So here's what's going on, okay? We spotted this a couple of days ago. They lived on, on the water down there, and what happened, uh, you understand when the hurricane comes in, you got to beat, 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 everything beat down, but when it goes out, it takes everything with it. And we learned this our, personally for Hurricane Opal, when it came back through, my son Chip was at a house, he talked about when the water came back through, it did more damage and more timber cracking than any of it, because the force of it coming back through. Same thing happened down there with, with Michael. So it swept out, out into the St. Joe Bay, and they found their chair sitting there, just on low tide the other day, and here's a chair here. But it's just fascinating, I wanted to share with you the power and force again, even seven months later, we get some uh, amazing things that uh, we're seeing, and that's the chair from their living room uh, sitting out there in the bay. It had been underwater until recently, and it's sort of been washed back in now, but I, I thought that was interesting. Okay, uh, we'll talk about Jim Fowler tomorrow. Let me get on over here to, uh, talking about the environment and all, uh, let me see, look at this right here, this is cool. This is what Australia is doing. I just wanted to look at it, at, at these draining pipes in order to save everything washing into the ocean and bay system and river system. They're putting up these huge net, uh, like a, you know, it's a big shrimp net almost, and put it there and it collected. I got several pictures of it, and uh, sometimes they put, put some across there. The water still flows through and they just empty that out. That is a brilliant idea, and that's something that we definitely need need to look at here. They've got different sizes, different different ways to do it, especially these large uh, ways to wash into the water. And I just want to, uh, I just I was just fascinated with that. Okay. All right, now I got an email. I want to read this email. Pretty long email. Uh, maybe I'll get through it. This comes from Bud Sparrow. He said, "Hey, Winston." I wanted to thank you for showing the public ramps like I asked a week or so ago. I also would like to weigh in on the trout bag limits, okay? I would like to bring some attention to why I think most of the reason numbers are down. This is interesting now. I have fished and guided in Choctaw Bay since 1970. That tells him something right there. He's got a lot of experience. He's been fishing and guiding since 1970 in Choctahatchee Bay. The numbers and sizes are down, and I feel a lot of the reason 
is all is all over the over the shrimping. It is not all uncommon to see six or seven boats out shrimping every night. My son has worked on a shrimp boat, and I can tell you that he has thrown out well over two 55-gallon drums full of trout and flounder every night. He has he has told me. Not to mention, you cut down on what the bait fish and what the bait fish eat, and you cut down on the amount of bait fish in the bay for the trout to eat. I am all for people making a living, but I think that along with cutting bag limits, they need to cut down the amount of shrimping activity or some kind of quota. Maybe you can bring this up to your next FWC guest and see what they think. What do you think about that aspect of the problem, or, or do you think I am way off on this? I really do enjoy your show and the subjects and guests you have. By the way, my wife and I went up to Choctatchee River today and went up with 24 nice hand-sized shell cracker, Bud Sparrow. That is a, uh, thank you Bud for sending that. It's a, good, it's a good reflection from someone who's been on the water, you know, for this, this long. And it, it, it's, a, it's a subject where, you know, we have commercial shrimping and fishing and all, and that's part of it that we supply the public with. At the same time, we have fishing where we like to enjoy it. And there's got to be a balance there. I know they have restricted the shrimping at night and in certain areas. I know north of the uh, bridge there in, in uh, where I live, they can't shrimp at night because that's an estuary. And if you can just have certain areas where, where it was protected, where all the bait and fish and all are, that's one of the big, that's one of the big uh, solutions to the problem, protecting some of the areas. And I'd be interested to hear from some of the shrimping families and all what, what they think about it, because I know they, they try to balance it out, and I know intentionally they don't do it, but I know sometimes they, they really do uh, uh, get into a lot of uh, good game fish and all, but they try to, they have turtle excluded, excluded devices, TEDs, to let the turtles out. But I know it's a hard living as a shrimper. <laughs> they work hard and it's a hard living. But a lot of it is done you know, out, outside the base system. But you're right, the base system needs to be protected. So let's uh, wrap it up for today. We appreciate the feedback. Appreciate you supporting our sponsors. You have a great day. Enjoy the day. Do something good for your fellow man. And God bless. Thanks for watching America's only daily outdoor TV show, Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester, featuring hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.